Okay, um, hello again. So um, I guess the last uh, video on, on how isotopes can be used as proxies uh, was very long. Um, so we'll try not make this one as long. Um, uh, but this is uh, going to be about how we can use the elemental composition of uh, corals, I guess for calcium carbonates, can be used, elemental proxies can be used in other media other than corals, in forams, in, in, in bivalves, uh, all kinds of different uh, things that grow calcium carbonate from uh, water. Um, they can be used uh, in terms of their elemental composition. So let's have a look at what I'm talking about. Makes sense. Um, so uh, yeah, so again, just, just we've got this uh, skeleton that's composed of, of calcium carbonate. And we've already been talking about how we can use changes in the oxygen isotopes preserved in that to tell us about temperature and salinity uh, and how we can use the carbon isotopes that are that are in the carbon of calcium carbonate to tell us about um, uh, the, uh, I guess, the, the, the metabolic um, conditions that that coral is experiencing. And we can also look at the organic carbon component as well to tell us something about um, the, the, the food the coral has been eating and what's going on with that. Uh, but we're going to be looking now at uh, the calcium uh, and what could substitute for the calcium. So not every atom in, in calcium carbonate uh, is obviously not every atom, some of it's carbon and oxygen, but not all of the calcium actually is calcium. It doesn't make sense, does it? Um, but you can get small amounts of different elements just replacing some of that calcium um, because the, the solution that the, that the calcium carbonate is growing from isn't necessarily pure. It doesn't just have calcium, it has lots of other elements in. Uh, and um, so that can tell us, as we saw with the rhenium, if we have a high rhenium concentration in the water, that will be reflected in a higher rhenium concentration uh, that ended up being preserved in the coral. Uh, but actually, there, there are other kind of factors at play, not just the, the concentration of these elements. Um, so we're going to start out by looking at um, uh, let's see, uh, what is, is it, uh, P? Uh, no, control P. There we go. Aha. For the pen, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, strontium. Uh, so uh, before we do that, actually, you know, lots of other uh, elements are available to the geochemists. There are all kinds of different elements that could, could substitute in uh, for calcium. Um, so uh, I guess there are these uh, concepts in geochemistry uh, that um, you can substitute in to a mineral uh, different elements if those elements are roughly the same. So if they're a similar charge and a similar size, uh, they can quite easily uh, fit into the, um, the, the older coral uh, skeleton. Um, so actually, to back to this, so if we've got calcium carbonate, uh, uh, give myself uh, is it, uh, age highlighter? No, no, it's not. Um, but anyway, uh, give myself the pen again. So if we've got uh, calcium, uh, so magnesium is quite similar. So we might expect if there's a magnesium in the solution, we might get some magnesium substituting in to uh, that, um, that crystal structure. Um, similarly, strontium, that's got a similar charge, uh, two plus and uh, similar, similar, similar size. Magnesium is smaller, strontium is bigger. But also iron, if we've got some iron and that happens to be in the two plus state, that would quite easily fit into, that's very similar to the calcium. So that could fit in as well. So, um, there's loads of different elements that would fit in uh, to, to our calcium site in, in our mineral. Uh, but also we, we need to consider you know, what's actually going to be present in the water. Uh, and these are some, uh, I guess, data from, from the um, I guess average ocean. Uh, and if we have a look at uh, calcium, it's got this kind of vertical profile of um, concentration in the, in, as you go down into the ocean. And that's because it's it's a very soluble element, so it's what we what we tend to call conservative. Um, so its concentration doesn't tend to, to, to vary much. So uh, if we're looking at uh, elements that vary a lot, uh, so for instance, iron, large variant of iron here. Where's uh, uh, I've got uh, other things? Praseodymium uh, seems to vary in the ocean quite a lot. Um, we could maybe measure the uh, calcium to lanthanum or calcium to uh, tesium 
uh, ratios, and that might tell us something about the variability of that element in the ocean, because calcium concentration is not changing anywhere, it's kind of fixed. Uh, so any changes in the, um, the element ratio is quite largely due to these large variations in the elemental abundance of the ocean. But if we look at, at strontium, so strontium also, other elements also, lots of other elements, have this uniform profile everywhere in the ocean. Um, so this is what we tend to call conservative elements, and that means that their, um, although their concentrations may change a small amount, because if, we, if it rains, for instance, we add fresh water and that would dilute the concentration of these elements. But uh, what it does mean is that their, their, their elemental ratios of one to the other is fixed. So if we were to uh, add fresh water or evaporate um, some water, that would change the concentrations of all of these elements by the same amount or the same relative amount. And that's the case for uh, calcium and strontium. So these, these data we've got calcium are on the top axis up here and strontium on the bottom axis. Uh, and just uh, the one on the right, that goes from zero to, to some number. So you can see that we don't have much variation at all in the water column. We have these very constant profiles in terms of concentration and depth. But actually, when you look on a much zoomed in scale, we do see these variations in concentration, and these are due to changes in salinity. So uh, slightly uh, fresher water up here, slightly saltier water uh, here, and that's changing the concentrations of these elements. But if we were to measure the ratio of them, uh, it would be constant. It would be constant at this point, 0 0.0086. And that's the same everywhere in the ocean. So why would we care about measuring this in corals then, if it's the same everywhere? Well, it turns out that the, um, the, the ratio of strontium to calcium that gets actually preserved in the corals is not exactly what is present in the ocean. So here are some data from um, a coral. Uh, and you can see that, uh, I guess here's that 0086 value. So seawater should have a value like this. Should be along like that. But all of these uh, coral, the samples from corals here, have uh, ratios that are higher. We're higher. We've got more strontium. And actually, this the reason for this is that the, the crystal structure of aragonite actually means that uh, it's, um, it's preferentially incorporates strontium over calcium. So strontium uh, wants to be incorporated, although it doesn't feelings for this inanimate element. Uh, it preferentially forms the, the mineral, and that's because the mineral aragonite is so similar to another mineral called strontiumite. So actually the, 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 the space inside uh, a strontium, uh, uh, sorry, uh, space inside the aragonite uh, crystal um, for the cation, for the, the calcium, that's perfectly sized for strontium. Uh, it's not quite the right size for the calcium. Uh, the reason why it actually forms calcium carbonate rather than strontium carbonate is because there is so much more calcium uh, available for it to form. Strontium is, is, as you can see here, it's millimoles per mole, uh, so it's 100 times less. Um, so uh, there's a preferential incorporation of, of strontium into this calcium carbonate mineral. And as it turns out that, that this incorporation is temperature dependent. So at higher temperatures, as we go to higher temperatures, the, um, the strontium and calcium tend to be more evenly mixed between the aragonite and the ocean. So we tend to tend towards this um, 0.86, tend towards this seawater value. Whereas at lower temperatures, the, the, the mixing, the even mixing doesn't win out. So the, the preference for strontium being in the, the carbonate, that wins out. So we get elevated strontium calcium ratios. So you can see that in the in the in the in the data over so these are the, the same data over here on, on, on the um, uh, uh, left hand side that um, uh, we can see that the temperature that this coral may do at is up and down with annual cycles. So these are some very closely spaced samples on annual layers. Um, so I guess this is perhaps one annual layer that's being sampled. 
through. So we can see the cycle in temperature. Uh, and that is reflected in this cycle of um, strontium over calcium in those corals. And you see when the temperature is cold, we have a high strontium to calcium ratio. And when the temperature is warm, we have a low strontium to calcium ratio. So what we can do is we can do the same thing we do with oxygen isotopes. I mean, there is some kind of underlying thermodynamics behind this relationship. But as it turns out, we just have to do an empirical calibration where we take uh, the temperature data here and we take the strontium calcium data here and we put them one on top of each other and produce a calibration curve. Uh, and then we can apply that to fossil corals where we don't know what the temperature was to, to, to use a proxy. Now, again, it's there, it's not quite as, as simple and straightforward uh, as that. When we, we look in really close detail, uh, if we go down to the, the microscopic le level, if we were to sample uh, uh, rather than kind of uh, sample on maybe, uh, 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 maybe a sub millimeter scale, if we were going down to the micron scale, uh, which is what's being done here with, with an iron probe um, by Nikki Allison uh, based in St Andrews, um, what she's done here is she's shown that actually if you were to sample kind of very small, oh no, very small scales, tiny little sampling spots as she's gone down here, um, uh, you can see that there are huge variation in the strontium calcium ratio from near the seawater value of 8.6 millimoles per mole up to 10.2. Now if we go back and have a look at what that means in terms of the temperature, that's that's more, that's more than all of the temperature variation, or more than the strontium calcium variation we see on this annual cycle. And that's because uh, there are subtle kind of chemical effects that are going on because you get different preferential uh, incorporation of strontium, dependence on the size of the crystals and also the organic content of them. You can see these centers of calcification here, with lots of organic carbon. They tend to bias the strontium calcium ratio little bit. So actually, so this can't be temperature dependent, it can't, it can't be temperature causing this, because the time scale over which these crystals grew was not long enough for the temperature in the water to change by, by this amount. Um, but um, with these complications aside, we are seeing these kind of large changes on a very, very small scale. But if we were to, instead of using uh, an iron probe to, to sample very, very small Tiny little bits of coral. If we were to just to use a either a, a micro drill or a, a larger um, laser that would maybe sample kind of sample bits of coral this big, and then the next point might be a sample of coral that big. The next one will go on uh, sample as the coral grows up and up and up. Sample that big. That tends to average out all of this variability here, and we would just get um, basically one value for that. Uh, and we would then pr produce an empirical calibration with that, and that's that's effectively what people do when they when they um, when they sample uh, corals. They, they, they calculate their, their, um, uh, their, their temperatures. From them. So this is uh, uh, another example where someone has has taken this coral here, uh, and then they've basically drilled out along the growth axis. You can see the annual annual layers here. Uh, and then within each layer, let's have a look, they've got maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, about 20 different uh, samples within each of these annual bands. So 20 samples in there. And you see that's about a centimeter per year. So you're looking at maybe sampling every half a millimeter. And that's big enough to average out some of this micron scale uh, variability. And when you do this, you do find that if you if you look at strontium calcium and the temperature that's if you maybe uh, sampled your coral uh, next to somewhere where there was one of these uh, moored temperature recording buoys, uh, you can see that the temperature and the strontium calcium are really tightly coupled together. Um, so it's looking like the, the, the strontium calcium is at least faithfully recording temperature um, 
It's not perfect. You can see that there are some places, this here, where there's a, there's a substantial discrepancy. It's not a perfect recorder uh, of, um, of temperature. And there could be other things that are causing this, this co-variation. So just because there's a good correlation, it could be that the strontium calcium is varying in an annual cycle for some other reason, um, but uh, that just so happens to coincide with the, the, the temperature, because that also varies in an annual cycle. Um, close to that part. But anyway, uh, so we, we do an empirical calibration and it appears to work. Um, it should be noted that when people do empirical calibration, so there are a bunch of different studies on here, the text is very small, you can't read them, but that's deliberate. Uh, when people do these empirical calibrations, they don't agree that well. Um, so people tend to get similar slopes, uh, different offsets. Uh, so uh, when you're doing um, a, a paleo uh, coral study, uh, you tend to have to do a calibration for the specific species of coral that you're, you're measuring. Uh, but also it, there seems to be some variability between sites in terms of this empirical calibration. So again, there, there are other controls other than temperature that are not fully understood. But empirical calibrations do tend to appear at least to work fairly well. Um, so let's have a quick look at some of the things that can go wrong. Uh, so here's a coral, um, uh, and you can see, uh, can you just read that? I think it's Beaker or just Scepter. Anyway, uh, Scepter, I think. Anyway, you can see the center of calcification um, along this dark line in the middle. Uh, you might be able to, to make out on this one here these radiating needles of uh, aragonite moving out from the center. Uh, but you can see on the edge of the, the coral, there's these uh, these spiky, spiky crystals along the edge. Oh, they look horrible. Um, and these are formed after the coral died, and the coral's basically been sitting in some water for some time. In this case, I think it might have even been exposed to, to meteorite water, so lifted out above sea level. Uh, and uh, these are these mineral overgrowths that are formed around the edge of the coral have formed a long time after death. Um, so even if they um, uh, are faithfully recording the strontium calcium uh, temperature equivalent ratio uh, that they formed at, they uh, will have formed at a different time, so they'd have the wrong temperature. They're also likely to be a different mineral. So in this case, I think these are um, in the middle calcite, uh, whereas this is the middle mineral aragonite. I realise that I probably spelled that wrong, but I guess my head is covering it uh, on the video, so that's not great. Um, so it will have a completely different chemistry. Uh, so if we were sampling this coral, we would definitely want to avoid sampling these uh, secondary mineral overgrowths and focusing on making sure our samples were drilled out of this coral or lasered from this coral in this, these positions here. In fact, we probably want to avoid the senses of calcification, so we scrub that and we'd probably want to sample like this. Um, so let's have a look at uh, the effect of that. So this is an example of a, a coral, I think this is one from Tahiti, uh, where it's been uh, lasered along the, the growth axis here. Uh, you can see, uh, the uh, growth lines of this coral subtly faintly in this uh, moving up like that. So it's been lasered uh, along here. Uh, a bunch of different chemical elements have been measured. Uh, but the thing to notice is that actually, as we go towards the, the top and the bottom, these dark areas in this X ray here, these dark areas here, are where the coral has, has, has suffered this, this slight recrystallization. Um, and you can see the effect of that in uh, the geochemistry. So you can see, uh, let's look at the uh, strontium calcium, that's uh, these data here. So along the center of the transect, we seem to have nice sensible variation, but as soon as we get to the edge, it starts to go crazy. Okay. Uh, we see that in the sulfur calcium, uh, the magnesium calcium, the barium calcium. So all of the element ratios seem to seem to behave very differently in these kind of uh, what we would say recrystallized or diagenetically altered um, regions of the coral. And this is the same. This is true. This is, I guess, this is if we've lasered the samples, we've sampled on a very small scale, or if we drilled out uh, powders using 
drill, I guess. So, uh, Thomas Felicy has come along here with the drill and he's drilled out some samples like this, maybe using a slightly smaller drill than that. Um, and you can see here that the samples near the edge, the data go crazy. So when sampling are called, we definitely want to avoid those altered areas. Uh, another example, just looking at some of this alteration we want to look out for. So here you can see a, a, another a micrograph of, of coral. You can see this nice pristine area of the coral skeleton here, and then this recrystallized area here. You can see some of these recrystallization textures up here in a photograph, and some of the pristine, nice unaltered corals over here, unaltered coral skeleton. And again, this is magnesium calcium, but it would be true for the strontium calcium as well. We tend to get kind of extreme ratios up here when we have these altered areas. So we would definitely want to avoid that those areas of alteration. Okay, so let's quickly now have a look at some examples of how we can use the strontium calcium as a, a paleo thermometer. So we can do our, our calibration. So this is uh, an example from the, the, the Western uh, Pacific, uh, from some disputed islands um, uh, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, and uh, yep, so these are, these are um, a variety of, of modern corals uh, that have been used for uh, calibration. And then uh, in some of the older reefs, um, uh, so this is basically a pit. Here's a pit, here's a person, the scale. Um, so uh, on these islands, there's um, some construction going on and been digging pits and they've been taking some fossil corals. Um, now with the modern corals uh, you can see the strontium calcium data at the top uh, and they've selected a bunch of different modern corals uh, and they've measured them all uh, and you can see that some corals, so this, this green one here, this is only sampled for basically this long, the, the purple one is sampled for this long, uh, there's a, a yellow one that's been sampled for this long, uh, and there's a blue one that's been sampled for this long. And you can see all of the different uh, corals, they seem to agree quite well in terms of their, their uh, strontium calcium uh, ratios as measured. Uh, and when you kind of do the uh, combine all of those data together to work out like one average coral and compare that with the sea surface temperature. So that's what's going on in this, this middle graph. So that's the average of all of these data kind of compared to the sea surface temperature. Uh, we get really good agreement. Uh, uh, and we can pr produce a local calibration curve. So this is our local calibration curve. Again, I've probably written that in the wrong place because my head will be over that. Feel free to move my head in the video if you, if you want to. Um, so what the authors uh, then do is they take this calibration curve and then they've applied that to some fossil corals. They've worked out the ages of some fossil corals uh, and then they've uh, um, seen what their strontium calcium ratio was uh, back in time. Uh, and they haven't got a continuous record, but they've got snapshots now into the past where you can see that actually the, uh, during um, uh, this northern hemisphere kind of cold interval, so this is that, uh, uh, I guess, temperature proxy based on uh, tree rings. So uh, periods when the northern hemisphere was kind of like cooler, uh, than, it, than it has been over most of the Holocene, I guess, or at least most of the last 2,000 years. Uh, we get slightly cooler on average uh, temperatures from, measured from uh, magnesium, uh, strontium, calcium. Uh, but interestingly, if we have a look at uh, the variance, so these are the modern corals here, we see during this area we have uh, more variability in terms of the, um, uh, the annual cycle in um, Temperature. So maybe what's going on here is we have more intense El Nino, uh, La Nina variability and uh, less so present. And then we go back to the uh, medieval climate anomaly, which is a period of relative warmth, uh, back to similar conditions to uh, today. And we can do that uh, for these corals, and they've, they've basically enabled um, uh, the, the detailed temperature reconstructions. Uh, in this region to be reconstructed back in time, which is pretty neat. Uh, another example, uh, this time uh, an island uh, further out into the Pacific. Uh, uh, we can look at um, uh, combining 
strontium, calcium, and oxygen isotopes to tell us something about salinity and temperature. If you remember, the oxygen isotopes were telling us about whether it was warm or wet, or warm and wet, uh, couldn't distinguish between the two, whereas strontium calcium uh, ratios are primarily a temperature proxy. So if we use the two together, we might be able to tease apart differences in salinity versus differences in temperature. So here are, here are, here are the data from, from a fossil coral. Uh, you can see that this one's uh, a single coral that's uh, been growing for over 200 years. Uh, you can see the annual cycles that have been measured in oxygen 18 uh, here. Uh, quite detailed data collection. We can see the strontium calcium uh, that's been measured here. So again, we've got um, uh, this is hotness up. You can see the scale has been uh, reversed um, because the calibration is a negative slope temperature. And again, the scale on uh, the uh, oxygen isotopes that's also been reversed. So this is uh, hot uh, and wet upwards. Okay. Uh, they've also measured uranium calcium as a, an additional uh, uh, proxy here, which uh, has also been used uh, for uh, salinity. Um, so uh, if we have a look at uh, the data um, uh, as it's been um, smoothed. So here's the raw data, I guess raw data over on the left, and we've got smoothed data uh, on, the, uh, on the right over here. And this is because the, the, the dominant feature in, in the data is the annual cycle. If we wanted to look at how one year is different from another, the changes in average annual temperature are tiny compared to the differences between winter and summer. Um, so the data have been smoothed. You can see that over here. And we've got the, I guess, that's what we're, the stuff. we've got the strontium, calcium, uh, and uranium calcium sea surface temperature estimates up here. Uh, uh, and you can see that some years tend to be warmer, then we might have a cold year and then a warm set of years. Uh, there does appear to be some cyclicity to this going up and down. Uh, and then uh, the next plot down is the oxygen isotopes. So this is a combination of warmness and wetness. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the, the two don't look the same. These do not look the same. Okay? And that's because uh, the coral oxygen 18 this signal here has some component of salinity. So we can kind of try and deconvolve that uh, to get just a sea surface salinity signal. And that's what's been done uh, here. So this is sea surface salinity. Um, uh, and so that's basically the oxygen isotope data with the temperature component of that variability removed with the uh, strontium isotopes, strontium calcium ratios. Uh, and what we can see here is, again, we've got uh, some what looks like cyclicity in the hydrological cycle every, uh, I think it's nine year cycle, roughly. Uh, we can see here uh, being kind of relatively wetter, relatively drier. But we do see this sudden change in the climate system in this region uh, here at, at around uh, 1905 to 1910, uh, where the, um, uh, I guess, the, 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 the region became a, a, a little bit wetter. Um, so that's kind of uh, an interesting kind of reconstruction of, of, of the climate of this, this region. Uh, so we're taken from like a combination of proxies to, to try and deconvolve our individual kind of climate um, changes. Um, so uh, that was uh, about uh, the proxies. So we, we've, we've looked at how we can use isotopes. We've looked at how we can use uh, trace elements to tell us about uh, the, the, the conditions, so the temperature, the salinity. Uh, we can also use the elemental composition to tell us about the, the, the chemical composition of the water, if it's particularly polluted or not. Um, so that's these uh, understanding these, uh, these proxies, okay? Oh, these proxies here. But um, uh, to, to fully make use of these proxies, we need to have some kind of time axis on our graph. Um, now with, with corals, uh, we can quite easily work, figure out time because they, they grow in these, these annual layers. We just count back the layers of a living coral uh, and then work out the age. That's great. But we saw with some of the examples uh, in one of the, the, the previous uh, studies that had these snapshots back in time, we needed to work out the age of the coral in some other way because the, the, the top of the coral 
it's some unknown age. How do we how do we figure out how old the whole hole is? Because it's being sold out of a quarry on an island. Um, so that's what the next video is going to be looking at, how we can figure out the ages of these corals. Um, yeah, so that's that. 30 minutes this time. So, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, take some notes. Um, but the next one will be more fun. Yay. Um, it will be good. You know, chronology is awesome. Uh,